take it away, John. Okay, thanks very much. Well, it's great to be here. Um, I like I like the idea of this whole conference or whatever you call it. <laughs> um, so I'm very excited to speak here. So I've been doing a bunch of work with Kenny Corser and Christina Vasilikopoulou on some math called Structured and Decorated Coast Bands. But I also want to say a little bit more about the general uh, world in which this work lives. Um, so I say here provocatively, it's a good time for category theorists to help save the world. That is because, first of all, the world is getting increasingly complex and increasingly reliant on all sorts of networks, electronic networks, communication systems, uh, social networks, and so on. And we need more flexible tools for dealing with those networks in order to ensure good outcomes. Um, I don't think category theorists are quite ready for this responsibility that they have now to be the ones who can organize networks, but category theory is beginning to have the tools to help uh, do these things. And some really great developments have happened in just the last couple of years. So as you, I hope maybe you know, there's this applied category theory conference series that happens every year. It's coming up again this year pretty soon. Um, associated to that, there's a school for students to learn applied category theory. It's quite competitive just because there's not enough slots. Uh, but what it means is that more and more category theorists are getting into applying the subject to all sorts of practical tasks. It's definitely not the sort of thing where you can just dive in there and start grabbing some tools off the shelf and applying category theory. We're really working out the basics right now. So it can be quite frustrating at times, but I think it's also very exciting. And another piece of the puzzle is that the Topos Institute, centered in Berkeley, run by Brendan Fong and David Spivak and others, is an institute that's trying to apply category theory to all these different kinds of problems. And they're just opening up. They've got an office right next to the subway station in downtown Berkeley near the campus. Uh, and I'm gonna be spending July there and looking forward to working with the people there. And so I hope more of you consider entering this field of applied category theory. So let me give you an example of what, what I'm talking about. So to tackle problems quickly and efficiently, we need to learn how to quickly assemble models of large complex systems from smaller parts. And recently, Evan Patterson and Mika Halter showed how to do this using category theory for the model of COVID-19, which was used by the UK government for making its predictions. So I will give out these slides to anyone who asks that they should be available some various ways. And then you can click on this blue stuff and see what I'm talking about. So Evan and Mika wrote a nice blog article called Compositional Epidemi <laughs> Epidemiological Modeling Using Structured Co-Spans. And I was really excited about it because they were doing quite practical things using a bunch of ideas from category theory, some of which I've been involved in. They used Petri nets, which I've really been studying. They've been using a specific kind of Petri nets due to Joachim Koch. Um, and they stuck together these Petri nets to form larger ones using tools such as decorated co-spans, which were invented by my student, Brendan Fong, who's now, uh, as I said, helping run the Topos Institute, and also structured co-spans which I've been working on with Kenny Cursor and others. So I'll say a bit about what all these things are, but the cool part to me is that these are sort of freshly minted tools from category theory, precisely designed to assemble large complicated networks out of smaller pieces. And these folks, Evan and Mika, who are good at computer programming and very smart in lots of other ways, managed to apply them to a very practical purpose uh, quite rapidly. So the idea here is that you can use these mathematical tools I was talking about to build a large model. And this is a portion of 
the model of coronavirus used by the UK government out of smaller pieces. So these different, um, these different orangish boxes are different kind of transitions and these different blue circles are different types of populations of people. So for example, if someone who's healthy and under 35 gets sick, they go via one of these, they go from one of these blue circles to some other blue circle via one of these boxes. And then building, after building these models, you can translate these models in a systematic way, actually via functor, to get differential equations to describe how the populations of these various kinds of people changes with time. And then you can go ahead and solve these differential equations. So it turns out that to uh, build together these pictures like the one I'm showing here, or these sort of uh, graph-like structures, we can use the mathematics of structured cospans. Whereas to uh, work with the differential equations, it turns out that we need to use a slightly more general framework called decorated cospans. Uh, and I'll tell you about these things. But anyway, the great thing is that, uh, is that this math is now available in the form of computer code where you can actually uh, build these type of models using th this math. Um, so, what the, so what is all this stuff? So a Petri net with rates is what I'll be talking about a lot. Uh, it's a diagram of sets and functions that looks like this. So you have a set S, let's make it be a finite set of places. So those are the uh, yellow circles in this example picture down below. And then we have a set T of transitions, which are these aquamarine boxes. I just drew one in this baby example here. And so places are, you should think of them as being like different types of populations of entities. They could be actual physical places, in which case you might have like a, a bunch of people sitting on an island somewhere or sitting in Iceland or something like that. Uh, but they could be more metaphorical places like these are people who are not yet infected with coronavirus or something like that. Uh, and the idea is that these transitions will have a source and a target, but instead of a graph where each edge has just one vertex as its source and one as its target, uh, here S and T go from the set of transitions to what I'm calling N of S, which is the set of finite formal sums of elements of S. So for example, the target of this transition here is two times this place here, meaning that um, when something comes out of this transition, <laughs> when, uh, well, when things come out of this transition, two of them come out and, they, and they're of this type. Or, oh, I'm sorry, I should say two of this type plus one of this type. So it's actually two of this plus one of these or what pop out of this box. And the source of this transition is this place here plus this place because you, one of each of those things goes in. So if we just had that little portion of what's going on, uh, we'd call that a Petri net. It's a very simple thing, but we're gonna work with Petri nets with rates where also each transition has a positive real number attached to it via this map R. And that number is called the rate constant of the transition. And in this picture, I've just drawn that constant right on the box there. So the rate constant of this box here is six. And we need those constants there to be able to translate these pictures into differential equations. And so this rate constant here tells you something about how fast the, or how rapidly this process occurs. So, so one thing you can do is you can take any Petri net with rates and you can get a dynamical system, which is just a fancy way of saying a bunch of first order differential equations. So this is a super famous example called the SIR model of infectious disease. It's the very first model people learn about when they're studying uh, modeling of infectious disease. And so to give the game away, this place here, S, stands for susceptible people, people who can get the disease. This is I, 
meaning people who are infected, and this is R, meaning people who have recovered. So SIR means susceptible, infected, recovered. And there are two transitions here, these two aquamarine boxes. The first one is called uh, transmission. So it's where a susceptible person and an infected person meet and the susceptible person catches the disease. And so then out come two infected people. So the susceptible person has become infected and the infected person stays infected. So the source of this transition is S plus I and the target of this transition is I plus I or two I. And then in addition, we have another transition here called recovery where an infected person can become a recovered person. Now in the simplest way of turning this diagram into a set of differential equations called the law of mass action, uh, we can completely systematically turn a crank and from this picture, get this set of differential equations. So what's going on here? Well, you can look at it. Uh, so it has various terms at the right-hand side, describing the time derivatives of the S of t, I of t, and R of t, which are three functions of time, three real valued functions of time, to tell you the population of the susceptible, infected, and recovered patients. So we're treating those as continuous variables, differentiable variables. Of course, people don't come in fractional amounts, but if you have very large numbers of people, you can approximately write differential equations that describe how their population changes with time. And that's what we're doing here. And you'll notice that some of the terms on the right-hand side involve this first transition, the, uh, trend, the, the one where someone catches a disease, those are these two, and some depend on R2, those are the ones that involve the recovery. Maybe I'll do the recovery one first. So recovery occurs at a rate equal to the number of infected people times this rate constant R2. So that's why we're getting R2i here, showing up twice in fact. It shows up twice because when recovery occurs, an infected person goes away so that's why we get minus R2IT showing up in the time derivative of the number of infected people, but also a recovered person shows up. So we get R2 of IT showing up with a plus sign in the time derivative of the number of recovered people. So if that's all there was to it, this would be very analogous to a famous differential equation describing radioactive decay where radioactive atoms uh, decay at a rate proportional to how many there are. That would be formally the exact same system. But now we have this extra feature that a susceptible and infected person can turn into two infected people. That we assume occurs at a rate proportional to the number of susceptible people times the number of infected people and then times this rate constant R1, which is just some real number that the modeler has to estimate. So that's showing up with a minus sign here because one susceptible person goes away when this tra disease transmission process occurs. And it's showing up with a plus sign here in the time derivative of I of t because, well, one infected person entered the transition, but two came out. So the net increase in the number of infected people is one when this process occurs. So we get R1 times one times S1 of t times s2 of t. Uh, we're not seeing any more fancy coefficients than plus or minus one here, but that's just because of the simple nature of this Petri net. If, for example, an infected person turned into two recovered people for some mysterious reason, then there, we'd stick a two in front of this in front of this term here. So, even if you didn't completely follow the details of of how I did this, it doesn't matter too much nearly compared to this fact, which is that there's a completely systematic procedure for taking a uh, Petri net with rates and turning it into a set of differential equations. So the fact that it's completely systematic, if you're a category theorist, should make you think of the word functor, because a functor is a completely systematic procedure for turning an object of one kind into an object of another kind. And indeed, we're gonna turn this thing into a functor, the, this whole process of translating this top thing into this bottom thing. So that's part of the game here. So anyway, then you can of course solve the differential equations. And here's an example 
uh, solution of these differential equations with certain values for the rate constants. So you start out with a lot of susceptible people, it goes down as the number of infected people goes up, but then as recovery occurs, the number of infected people goes down again. And an interesting feature of this set of differential equations is that depending on the choice of uh, the rate constants, different types of things can happen. And in particular, it's not always true that everybody gets infected. So here you see that uh, I guess 20% of people uh, just never, never become infected. Um, whereas if you turned up the rate constants on transmission of the disease, it, you could wind up with a situation where eventually everybody gets infected. So this is a very simple model. It doesn't include the fact that people die of diseases. It doesn't include all sorts of other complicating factors. But the point is that this very simple Petri net with rates is like a prototype of the much more complicated ones like the one I showed at the beginning of the talk where you have a lot more things going on. Now, what I want to do is build big complicated Petri nets with rates out of little simple building blocks. But when you stick the building blocks together, you need to know how you're going to stick them together, where you're going to stick them together. And so for that, we introduce open Petri nets with rates. Open is just a, a name for uh, a system that can interact with the outside world where things can flow in and out. And so this is just a picture of an open Petri net with rates. It's the same Petri net with rates, but here we have a finite set of purple dots that I might call inputs. And here's a finite set of purple dots that I will call outputs. And they're equipped with maps to the set of places. And so the idea is, for one, that we can actually get a set of differential equations from an open Petri net, but it's what I would call an open dynamical system, meaning a dynamical system where the time evolution depends on some extra functions whose, which are themselves not determined by the differential equation. So the idea is you could have various ways for people to enter this whole system to like come to town, for example, from two different, on two different trains, for example, and, and, and enter say in the susceptible state, or they could come in and be infected from the very start, or they could come in or for that matter, go out uh, in the resistant state. And so we indicate those, that's what these purple dots are for. And so you'll see what I've done is I've taken the same set of differential equations and added some or subtracted some extra terms. So for example, because there are two ways for susceptible people to come in from the outside world, we will make up two extra functions, I1 of t and I2 of t that we add to the time derivative of S of t. These functions are not functions that this, uh, this model doesn't tell us what those functions are. These could be arbitrary functions. In some sense, they would be determined by the outside world, or they could be determined by some other Petri net that we decided to stick this Petri net onto. Here is I3 works the same way. Uh, for purely formal reasons, when a place is, uh, has an output mapping to it, we stick a minus sign there. That's just to make it convenient to think of it, uh, pay, uh, people leaving from that point. But these functions, I1 and, and I2 and O1 and so on, uh, they could be positive or negative. So it's certainly possible in this model to have people come in the so-called output. It's just that then we need to make O1 be negative so that this term here gets to be positive. It's just a convenient, it sounds confusing, but it's a convenient thing. It's just like how when people are keeping track of electrical current, you, you need to say wh which way the current is flowing along the wire and, and, and if it's flowing the other way, well, then you say the current is negative. The old mystery of negative numbers, in short. Um, now, what is a cospan? What is an open Petri net with rates a bit more formally? Well, for starters, it's what we call a cospan of finite sets, which is a fancy name for three finite sets and maps from the outer two to the one in the middle. So here we have our finite set of the inputs, the finite set of the outputs, and they're getting mapped to the set of places here in the middle. Um, 
But of course, there's more to the open Petri net with rates than just that, because this big box in the middle here, we don't want to have just a set of places. We want it to have, we want it to be an open Petri net. We want it to be a Petri net with rates. So, so we say that we have a coast band with finite sets where this middle piece, which in coast band jargon we call the apex, uh, is equipped with some extra data, namely this Petri net. Um, it sounds very complicated, but I'm really just describing in mathematical terms what you see before you, which is a finite set A, a finite set B, functions from them to these set of yellow circles, and then also a Petri net with rates, having those yellow circles as the places. So this is the idea of a structured cospan. It's a cospan, in this case, a cospan of finite sets, but then equipped with some extra structure in the so-called apex. And I got to realizing a while back that that was a very common uh, thing to see. In particular, for example, these open dynamical systems of which I showed you an example, it's also a co-span of finite sets where the apex is equipped with some extra data. Namely, it's as a co-span of finite sets, it's exactly the one we had before here, but now the extra data that we're equipping this thing with is a collection of differential equations. That, that's harder to draw pictorially, but, it's, but it is just some extra data that we're slapping on top of that set in the middle. Um, so, so this leads us being category theorists to want to understand in general what's going on here when you have a co-span and you're trying to equip the apex with some extra data. So, so far people have thought of two main ways of equipping an object of a category with extra data. Um, well, at least in this context here. So we just give them the name structure and decorate just for the sake of having some different terms. So they don't mean too much, but so one way is that if your category A, which in our example is the category of finite sets, is the target of some functor that's a right adjoint, we can give an object of A extra structure by choosing an object X in X such that R of X is equal to A. So you're very familiar with that in mathematics. If you studied math, for example, you could say like, I'm gonna give this set the structure of being a group. Then A is the category of sets, X is the category of groups, and you're picking a group whose underlying set is that set. Um, but you can do that for all sorts of things like Petri nets and differential equations and all sorts of stuff. The other approach, which Brendan Fung came up with, and which Kenny Cursor polished up a little bit, is, sounds a little more complicated. So you've got a kind of functor from A to cat, the, the category of all categories, roughly. And the idea is the way you decorate an object of A now is you, is you pick an object in F of A. So in other words, to each object in A, you get a category of possible decorations that you could slap on it, and to actually decorate an object, you pick D in F of A. Now there's some interesting subtleties here because cat doesn't really want to be a category. The category of categories is not actually so great. What you really want to talk about is the two category of all categories. That is, you want to talk about categories, functors, and natural transformations. And if you take the whole lot of those things, they form a thing called a two category. And so the correct kind of map from a category to a two category is called a pseudo functor. I don't think I'm gonna get into too much of the details about such matters, even though there are tons of fun, uh, because I just wanna march ahead and show you what we can do with this stuff. But anyway, if anyone wants to know what a pseudo functor is, I can tell them, well, it may, it may be a lot easier with a whiteboard. Uh, so now it turns out that the first approach the structuring approach is really convenient when you can do it, and it's convenient for open Petri nets, or open Petri nets with rates is actually what I should be talking about here. But it turns out that approach doesn't actually work for open dynamical systems, that is our bunches of differential equations, so we really need to use decorated cospans to handle that example. 
And so as mathematicians, if you want to be able to bounce back and forth between these two different approaches, you want to have a theorem that relates the two. And that's what Kenny and Christina and I proved. And the trick is something called the growth and deconstruction, which is that if you have a pseudo functor f from a to cat, then it always gives you a functor r from some category called the growth and category of f, written with this interesting integral sign, to a. And so, if, so that integral of f thing, that should be your x if you're trying to get from the decorated approach over to the structured approach. Now, it's not always true that that functor r from the integral of f to a will be a right adjoint. But under certain conditions, it will be a right adjoint. And so we need a theorem that says uh, when that's the case. I'm sort of amazed that I don't know, uh, I don't know enough studies of, the, of, the, of, of these theorems, of a theorem that proves this uh, until, until Kenny and Christina and I thought about it. It would have just been something like, something that was done and proved in 1960 or 1970 or something, but I didn't see it anywhere. So we had to prove it. So, okay, let me tell you a bit more about structured cospans. That's the first approach. So the idea is we've got a right adjoint functor R going from X to A. And what's a structured cospan? Well, it's a cospan that is a diagram of this shape. It looks like a little bridge, uh, but the arrows are pointing up. So it's a cospan instead of what's called a span. And, and it's a diagram in A but not just any old diagram in A because the apex, now you can see why it's called an apex, it's up on top here, is not just any old object in A, it's an object of the form R of X. So you should think of A as a category of objects with less structure and X is the category of objects with more structure and R is this forgetful functor. So that's one way to think about it. So like A and B could be finite sets and R of X could be the set of places of a Petri net X. Um, so I've resolved to not look at the chats. Uh, I see the chat blinking templingly, but I will resist because Matt said, Matt and Paula will, uh, will interrupt me if there's a question that, that, that's of the sort like, huh, what's going on? Uh, please explain. So I will uh, I'll wait for such type of questions. Um, okay. Now, the great thing though about a right adjoint is that it has a left adjoint, right? So if we have this functor R going from X to A, that's a right adjoint, there will also be a functor L going back from A to X, which is a left adjoint. And it turns out that it's a little bit more convenient to describe structured cospans in those terms. So a, a morphism from A to R of X is in one-to-one -one correspondence ah, with a morphism from L of A to X. So we just rewrite the picture this way. And the advantage now is that now uh, everything is in X and we can compose these cospans by doing what's called pushouts in the category X. So there's a way to compose cospans, which I'll talk about. Um, so, so the big theorem about structured cospans is proved by Kenny. And it says, suppose A and X have finite co-limits. So that's things like uh, pushouts and uh, co-products and an initial object. And suppose L is some functor that preserves finite co-limits. Well, one great thing is that a left adjoint, adjoint always preserves all co-limits. So if L is a left adjoint, we're good. Then we get a kind of thing like a category of structured cospans, but it's actually fancier than a category. So it'll have objects and the objects will be just objects of A. And it will have these morphisms that are these structured cospans that I just told you about. So this is a picture of a structured cospan here. But also there will be some other kinds of things you can do. There will be morphisms in A, which go between objects of A as well. And we will draw those going vertically to keep them straight from these cospans, which we're gonna draw as so-called horizontal one cells. We'll draw those horizontally. 
And in addition to having these so-called vertical morphisms and horizontal one cells, we'll actually get some sort of square or rectangle shaped things. And notice this has a horizontal one cell on top and a horizontal one cell on the bottom. It has a vertical one morphism on the left and a vertical one morphism on the right. Notice that I've slapped an L on everything here to make, to make it all parse. But what's really, what, what really is going on here is that we have a morphism, uh, little f, going from A to A prime. And so that's a, a vertical one morphism. So the idea of a double category is it's a souped up version of a category that you use when you have two concepts of morphism that you're interested in, uh, which you can separate out and call them vertical and horizontal. And then you want to have some kind of two-dimensional morphisms uh, going from a horizontal morphism to another horizontal morphism. And so indeed, there's a very nice kind of map from one structured cospan to another structured cospan, which is just this kind of commutative square of this sort here. So, so you may have wanted to get a category of where the morphisms are structured cospans. And indeed, you can extract that out of all this big fancy mess that I'm giving you here. But it turns out that this more complicated thing has sort of everything you would ever want to talk about when you're studying structured cospans. And in fact, it's not only a double category, it's what's called a symmetric monoidal double category as well, which is, says that you can tensor things as well. I'll show you some examples of this in a minute. Um, there's a nice theory of double categories and Mike Schulman has a great couple of papers on symmetric monoidal double categories, which we're using here. Um, so you can begin to see the point maybe when you start composing these things. So I can compose a, let's talk about the top of these pictures first. I can, can here's a structured co-span that ends at L of B. Here's another one that starts at L of B. I can compose them and I get a structured co-span like this. And notice what I'm doing is I'm taking the push out uh, of X and Y over this object L of B that's mapping to both of them. I do the same thing on the bottom if I'm trying to compose this big fat rectangle with this big, big fat rectangle. And so that would be how we define a horizontal composition of these two cells. Vertical composition is easy because vertical, vertical morphisms, remember, were just uh, morphisms in, uh, in, in A. So we just compose vertically that way. Uh, so pictures will definitely help and I will give you some in a minute. That is not diagrams, but actual pictures of examples. But anyway, there's also this symmetric monoidal structure, meaning that you can tensor things or set them side by side. So in other words, if I've got a structured cospan and another completely different structured cospan, I can so-called tensor them using coproducts. And I just take the coproduct that's written with a plus sign here of everything in sight. So that's the basic idea. And it's important that L preserves uh, coproducts so that, for example, L of A1 plus A1 prime is isomorphic to L of A1 plus L of A1 prime so that we can think of it, uh, so that it, we know what it, how it should map to this just by taking these two maps and taking their coproduct. Okay, let me show you some examples. Well, I'll show you one example. So this is the one I was talking about. So for starters, there's this category where the objects are Petri nets with rates. So there are these things that I showed you before. So there are also morphisms between these things, which you define in the sort of, quote, obvious way. And then there's a functor, R, that goes from Petri nets with rates to, to finite sets, which does what I suggested, where you take any Petri net with rates and just pick out its underlying set of places. And it turns out that's a right adjoint. So it has a left adjoint. And this left adjoint takes any finite set and turns it into a Petri net with rates. And it's one that has that particular set of places and no transitions. So it's a very boring uh, uh, Petri net with rates. The free Petri net with rates on a finite set is, is a very simple thing. So we're all set, in short, to, uh, to apply the theory and see what we get. 
And so we get um, some- John, sorry, there yes. is a quick question in the chat. Uh, sure. Is the double category weak in the horizontal direction since pushouts aren't strictly associative, or is there some workaround? Yeah, it, yeah, it's weak. So, so following Mike Shulman, uh, all wise people have have decided that double category should be uh, weak. That is, composition in, in one direction should be just uh, associative up to an associator. Yeah, that's right. So we. So people used to call those pseudo double categories, but but they've taken over. <laughs> Just like every monoidal category, you assume the tensor product is weakly associative until, unless you say it's strict. So yep. Um. So, so we get a symmetric monoidal double category from this construction. If we write it down using all the notation, we get this horrible name for it. But I'm going to call it open Petri nets with rates. This little double O thing here, these funny doubled letters, that's to let you know it's a double category. Um, and so, so what is this thing in layman's term? So the horizontal morphisms are gonna be these open Petri nets with rates that I've just been talking about. The way you compose them is that you, here we have one going from A to B, and here we have another one going from B to C, and the way you can compose them is you just stick them together. So for every uh, element of the finite set B, it will map to two different places uh, by means of these maps that, that we have. And so then we just glue those two places together. We identify them, flip, and get one here. And so that process of gluing things together is exactly what category theorists do with a pushout. So probably most of you know a bunch about pushouts, but if you don't, Pushouts are just how you glue things together. And that's what we're doing here. Um, and so then the other thing we've got, which is this symmetric monoidal business, is that if you have two open Petri nets with rates, you can take their quote tensor product or use the monoidal structure. And what does that mean? It means you just set them side by side. So, um, so we, we just sit them side by side and we get an open Petri net going from the disjoint union A plus A prime to the disjoint union B plus B prime. So the idea is that the two basic ways of sticking together open systems are actually attaching the end of one to the end of the other and setting them side by side. And using those two basic operations, we can actually do lots of more complicated things, more complicated ways of, of building a big complicated system out of smaller parts. And that's what this is all about, building composite systems out of little building blocks. Um, there are also these two morphisms. So a two morphism can map, can go from one open Petri net to another. And here I've just drawn that a two, you can cook up a two morphism that goes from this one to this one here. And the way you do it is you just map these two places by a function to this place, map to these transitions to this one, Map this one to this one. And so it's a way of simplifying, in this example, first example, it's a way of simplifying a complicated open Petri net, not all that complicated, uh, to us to get a simpler one. So it could be that you could say like, eh, I don't wanna care about the difference between this and this, I'm just gonna map them down to the same thing. So there's some cases where you wanna simplify a model of a system by that method. Or you could also map, uh, this open Petri net to this one. And this is not really just simplifying it because we're now, we're, ma we're mapping all of this to this top part here, but then we're adding in some extra stuff. So you, so another kind of morphism of open Petri nets can map a simple one inside a more, into a more complicated one. And that's another thing you often wanna do is think of some system you're studying as being, being a sub system of some larger one. So all of this stuff is, contain in the horrible, scary phrase, symmetric monoidal double category. That's all these, all these things we can do. Now for open dynamical systems, it turns out that we need to use a different method called decorated cospans. I won't explain why the structured cospans don't work. Uh, in some of the papers at the end of this, these slides, it, there's some proof that it doesn't, that structured cospans can't handle the, the example of open dynamical systems. So remember, decorated cospans are where we've got a lax monoidal, <laughs> we've got some kind of pseudo functor 
it's, it's going to be monoidal in a sense, called lax monoidal, from our category A to cat. Now A, because it had coproducts, becomes symmetric monoidal with its coproduct as the monoidal operation. Cat has its Cartesian product as a monoidal operation. So then you can talk about a monoidal pseudofunctor from one to the other. But anyway, whenever you have that situation, you can define decorated cospans. So it's just, a, this cospan is just a cospan in A, but the way we're gonna equip the apex with some extra structure or decoration is we're gonna pick an object D in F of M. That's how this method goes. It's a different attitude. And so there's a theorem that I proved with Kenny Cursor and Christina Vasilikopoulou that says that you can get a symmetric monoidal double category when you're in this situation too. So this theorem should just look a whole lot like the last theorem, big fat theorem I showed you, except the assumptions are different. So we're assuming we've got this, well, as before, A has finite colimits, and, but now we have this thing, symmetric lax monoidal pseudofunctor from A to cat, and we get a symmetric monoidal double category out. And so the objects will be objects of A as before. The vertical morphisms are morphisms of A as before. Now the horizontal one cells are decorated cospans, and there are two morphisms going between decorated cospans, and it looks very much like what we had before, except now uh, we have to think about the decorations, and so there'll be a decoration uh, D in F of M and a decoration D prime in F of M prime, and luckily, uh, because F is a functor, big F is a functor, F of H will map D uh, to this category where D prime lives. So then we can pick a morphism to call it tau going from F of H of D to D prime. So that's some map of decorations. Um, so the most important thing to understand a little bit about is how you compose decorated cospans. So here's a decorated cospan. Here's another decorated cospan. This first one ends with a B. The second one starts with a B. How do you stick them together? Well, cospans you stick together using pushout. So here's a cospan, our first one. Here's our second cospan, and we form the pushout of the stuff in the middle. This is the coproduct of M and N, but then it maps to the actual pushout. And so then we get a new cospan containing A, C, and this pushout here. But how do we get the decoration on this new thing? Well, we had this decoration D of the first cospan and E of the second, so we get an object of F of M times F of N. But then, because F is lax monoidal, lax means that there's a map from F of M times F of N to F of M plus N. If it weren't lax, these would be isomorphic, but there, here there's just a map. Uh, and so we get this map, and then we can apply F of psi here to map our decoration over to the pushout. So basically, given two ways of dec decorating two things, we can, we can get a way of decorating this composite thing. So, so it turns out that this theory, which I very briefly sketched, I'm sorry, it's, it's probably not too easy to follow or to appreciate what's really going on there without more examples, but I just want to say that using this method, we can build a double category of open dynamical systems, where the horizontal one morphisms are the open dynamical systems. And then the point of all this is that we can actually now create a symmetric monoidal double functor going from open Petri nets to open dynamical systems. So that is this procedure that I was alluding to, where you take an open Petri net, and from it, you read off an open dynamical system. So, well, it was way, 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 way back here. I sort of hate it when people do that, but I'm doing it now. So, so here's an open uh, Petri net with rates. I said there's like some systematic procedure to get an open dynamical system from it. And so systematic is not a very precise term, but here it's being made very precise by saying, oh, it's a symmetric monoidal double functor. And what, what does that mean? Well, it means a lot of stuff, but one thing it means is that if you compose open Petri nets with rates 
and then turn them into systems of differential equations, it's the same as turning each one into a bunch of differential equations and then composing the differential equations. Now, you don't normally compose differential equations in a basic math class, but, but you certainly sort of do know how to like combine sets of differential equations. And that's what's going on. That's the composition in open dynam, actually. Similarly, we can tensor, and that just means setting things side by side. So that's actually less tricky. Um, one last technical uh, thing to get, let you know that this is really a real category theory talk. Um, so we could, we could start wondering when are decorated cospans also able to be described using structured cospans? Uh, and it turns out that that's true when your when you're F, your lax monoidal pseudofunctor, uh, when it gives you, well, it turns out that it always gives you a functor from A to symmetric monoidal categories. And sometimes it will factor through something called Rex. Rex sounds like it's the king of all categories, but Rex is short for right exact, which is jargon for having finite co-limits. So Rex is the name of the the thing of all categories with finite co-limits, the two category of all those. Uh, and when that happens, which turns out to happen a whole lot, then the decorated cospan symmetric monoidal double category is equivalent to the structured one. And to get that to work, you have to uh, figure out where you're gonna get the uh, left and the right adjoint that you need to do the structured cospan stuff. And as I suggested, you get that from the growth and deconstruction. So, so whenever you have a thing like this F here, it turns out that you can form a category called integral of F uh, and a functor from that to A. That's, that's what growth and deconstruction's idea was. Uh, but then sometimes it will be a right adjoint. And these hypotheses are turn out to be enough to, to, make, that, to make that work. Um, I'll just say a tiny bit more about this kind of abstract nonsense. Um, so Mike Schulman and my student Joe Moeller and Christina Vasilikoplu proved a couple of theorems, which if you put them all together, says that they're three things that are equivalent to each other. If you've got a category A with has just finite coproducts, that's all you need, then symmetric lax monoidal pseudo functors from it into CAT are the same, quote unquote, you know, they correspond to pseudo functors from A into symmetric monoidal categories, Simon CAT, or something this called symmetric monoidal op vibrations. This is probably only worth looking at if you already know a bunch about the growth and deconstruction. Uh, and well, like I said, you the way you get your X is by doing the growth and deconstruction. I'm probably covering too much stuff here, but you'll be glad to know that that part, that part is done, or maybe you'll be unhappy to know because you're like half understood it and you'd hope that I'd explain it all. Uh, I can talk about it in questions. But I just want to say a little bit more about uh, where all this, where do we go with this? What, what, what can we, what's left to do? Uh, I assume there are a bunch of younger folks here who are wondering what they're going to do with themselves. So I thought I'd say some kinds of things you can, you, directions you can go with this type of uh, thought. So well, I've been noticing at the uh, category theory uh, discussion forum, there's a thing called the category theory community server or Zula. It's a Zulip, which is some kind of software. Um, and you should all join that if you haven't, if you haven't yet. Um, and there you'll see there are a whole bunch of young category theorists who really like programming. Um, I'm terrible at programming, but I applaud, applaud those who, who like it. And so a bunch of uh, programmers are messing around with category theory. And in particular, for such people, I'd urge a good project would be to start developing more compositional modeling tools with the help of category theory, uh, building on the work of Fairbanks and Patterson that I've already alluded to. They were both involved in this uh, 
coronavirus compositional modeling that I was talking about. And they use the programming language Julia, and they're building a whole toolkit of category theoretic constructions so that you can say like, okay, I want to compose some structured co-spans or, oh, I have a Levere theory and I want to look at its models or something like that. Be able to do that all in code so that you can write code that uses these fancy and beautiful category theoretic constructions. There's a lot more to be done there. Um, for scientists and engineers, I think the big challenge is to really use, start taking advantage of compositional modeling and also uh, not just modeling existing systems, but designing systems. So when I go up to the Topos Institute in July, uh, Jamie Fairbanks and Evan Patterson are having a pr project with NASA where they're going to be uh, doing modeling of actually the re-entry of spaceships and the ablation of the heat shields when the when they're re-entering. And the idea is you model different systems like the heat shield, the flow of the air around the heat shield and so on. And then you try to use some of this math to compose uh, bigger models out of those smaller models. So back in the old days, which are actually not gone yet when every different scientist wrote their own code uh, to model one specific system, then the real big problem happens when you try to stick together those models into larger models because all of the different systems are described in incompatible ways and they're not designed to be able to be stuck together. Uh, and so this is the problem that uh, Fairbanks and Patterson are, have a grant to, uh, to work on. Actually, I guess it's Jamie Fairbanks who has a grant and part of the grant is that he gets to work on it with some people at NASA who have a concrete problem to solve. But there are so many concrete problems to solve. There's no shortage of them. So this is just an example. Finally, for those of you who are of more theoretical ilk, uh, there are lots of things left to do. So one other approach to gluing together systems to form larger systems is to use operads. An operad is just a gadget that is a method for gluing things together in very abstract and general sense. And so one question is which operads can act to glue together structured or decorated co-spans. So for example, uh, David Spivak introduced the operat of wiring diagrams as a way of sticking things together. Um, there should be some beautiful results connecting that operat and maybe related operats to structured and decorated co-spans. If you're interested in that, I urge that you talk to Christina Vasilikopoulou who knows about all this stuff and is probably, probably has a bunch of thoughts on this, just hasn't gotten around to writing them up. Um, a more ambitious goal is to unify all these different formalisms for networks that people have been talking about. Uh, so David Jazz Myers, who's currently a student of Emily Real, is writing a big paper attempting to unify lots of different network formalisms. So if you're interested in that, I urge you to talk talk to him. It wouldn't be no there'd be no point working on this if you didn't also talk to talk to him and to get the combined forces in some way. And then. Uh, one other thing is to actually study more examples. Actually, that's what I'm probably the best at, is uh, going out, looking at different kinds of networks that various scientists have studied and trying to understand them in a more mathematical way using some of this math I've described. So I've been doing it for things like chemical reaction networks or Markov processes or Petri nets and other things, but there are lots and lots of others they're gene regulatory networks. Uh, there's gonna be a project next summer at the American Mathematical Society at Brown. I think there's supposed to be like a week long program where I work with people to work with students to study gene regulatory networks. Uh, there are neural networks, both the ones in your brain and then also the artificial simulated neural networks, which are extremely popular in machine learning. All of these are examples of networks that can be described mathematically and should be fit into these uh, general frameworks as, as examples so that we can translate between them and other, and other things. The idea of fitting things into a general framework is not just to do it purely for the fun of it, although it's tons of fun, it, it's so that we can translate in a clean way between different formalisms. Um, let's see, so uh, I guess I'll just conclude by, pointing at some, some papers. Um, so Kenny's thesis 
on open systems, a double categorical perspective is, is a, one good place to start. Uh, so I wrote with Kenny on structured co-spans. We are, with Christina, we're currently trying to improve the proofs of the theorems in this paper relating structured and decorated co-spans. Right now on the archive, there's a paper where the proofs of the theorems are pretty scary. Uh, we're gonna try to make them nicer. Mike Schulman was the one who really uh, connected symmetric monoidal double categories to vibrations. Joe Muller and Christina Vasilikopoulou did, did more of that. And there's a blog article, which is on this nice blog uh, of Evan Patterson's, where, which shows the example of this particular article shows the use of these tools to model uh, coronavirus. But the whole blog is full of nice examples of computer software developed using category theory. Um, yeah, so what I should do soon is something like drop my slides into, into some place so people can get at them and then like they can click on these links and see this stuff. Okay, I think I'm done. I'm happy to answer questions. Awesome, let's all thank John for uh, an amazing talk, maybe with a silent applause, but 